Hello, everyone, and welcome to this special audio commentary track for Tales from the Crypt presents Demon Knight. My name is Michael Felsher. I'm a DVD producer and filmmaker, and I'm here today with the film's director, Mr. Ernest Dickerson. How are you today, sir? I'm fine and very happy to be here. Thank you. So tell me a little bit about how this project came to you. Where, what, were you what were you doing when uh, Tales from the Crypt Demon Knight came into your life? I was actually in uh, post-production on uh, my second film, Surviving the Game. And uh, I believe my agent told me that uh, Demon Knight was uh, going and they didn't have a director and, uh, and they wanted to meet me. So uh, I went in and I met with Gil Adler. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess the meeting went good because I got the job. <laughs> But uh, I had to meet with him, then I had to meet with Joel Silver. Mm -hmm. And um, and that was cool. Uh, Joel was cool. So uh, we got it going. The script was totally different than any other story in the Tales from the Crypt canon because uh, it was a spec script that was submitted to the producers. And um, it, it didn't have that traditional getting a comeuppance structure that most of the tales from the crypt stories had mm -hmm. it was uh it was it was a, a, an original story with an original mythology and um they decided that they wanted this to be their premiere film and were you familiar at all with the television show had you watched it up at any point up until then yeah i watched it uh, occasionally um i can't say i was a regular viewer but uh, but I did watch it, and I, but I also used to read the comic books. Oh, okay. Buried that axe in his chest. Oh, killing him was almost better than sex. Now, this sequence here was uh, directed by Gil Adler. Okay. Um, which is more in keeping with the, the typical tales from the crypt type stories. A wife who murdered her husband, mm -hmm. and uh, he comes back to get revenge. That comeuppance thing. So the the whole wraparound was directed by Gil. So no regrets about not getting to work with the Crypt Keeper. No, I was cool. I mean, you know, Gil and and the Crypt Keeper had a a, a great relationship. They'd worked <laughs> together for years, and uh, you know, he wanted to uh, work with the gentleman in the premiere movie. So I was more than happy to oblige. Plus, I had my hands full <laughs> with the rest of the movie. Right. So this wasn't your first exposure to horror, because you had actually, although you hadn't done worked on the Tales from the Crypt uh, TV show, you did work on Tales from the Dark Side. Yeah, I did. Uh, I was a director of photography on Tales from the Dark Side with the uh, the New York crew. Mm, okay. Because uh, there were two crews. There were there was the L.A. crew and the New York crew, and and uh, I did the New York shows. And um, it was on that show that I met Michael Gornick, mm. who was George Romero's cinematographer. And Gornick was getting ready to do uh, shoot Day of the Dead. And he needed some second unit work done. And he asked me to come down and uh, shoot it. And I did. That's a good introduction to horror, if I say so. I think that's pretty, that's pretty solid. Yeah, it was cool. And I met Greg Nicotero down there. That's where I first met him. Oh, that's right. Yeah, he was on uh, Tom Savini's crew. Yeah. yeah. And then we worked together years later. So what is it about horror that appeals to you? Because you've revisited the genre a few times throughout your career. I like, um, I like mystery. I like tales of uh, mystery and, and tales that uh, that challenge our imaginations. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I've been reading science fiction and horror since, since I was a kid. And, um, and you know, I'm, I'm very picky, I guess, in the kind of horror that, that I do. I mean, I like this script because it was a mythology that was... Uh, that was being set up, the whole thing with the um, the key keeper and the, mm -hmm. and the demon knights. Um, and um, 
I like these films because the, the best of these films tap into our dreams. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the best ones are almost pure cinema. And uh, I tried to be as purely cinematic with this film as I could. Uh, we shot this sequence out in a place called Saugus, out in the desert, mm -hmm. outside Los Angeles. You have William Sadler as your protagonist here, and what was your experience like working with him? Because he was pretty, he was coming off a really successful string of movies at that time with like Die Hard 2 and Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. I think Shawshank Redemption was right before this for him. Yeah. Yeah, Bill was great. I mean, we had, we had such a great cast on this. Yeah. Uh, it was, uh, we had the script, the script was good, but we, there was a little bit of, improvisation going on mm -hmm. I encouraged that with the actors Jackie Brown Carmen who cast it had also cast my first film Juice oh. and, um, and we enjoyed a good relationship now the script originally was not supposed to be a Tales from the Crypt movie per se it was just an original script correct? Yeah, it was just a spec script that was submitted to the producers. Um, I believe there was a script that they had that was more a traditional Tales from the Script type story that was originally going to be done. But um, for some reason, they decided to let this one be the first uh, Tales from the Crypt movie. Maybe because... It, it has spectacle. Mm -hmm. It's more spectacular. Um, and uh, I always thought that the way this story goes, it could continue. Mm -hmm. It could There could be more than one Demon Knight movie. Oh, sure, yeah. This is my editor, Stephen Lovejoy, who has edited everything I've done <laughs> since then. This was our first film together. Oh, really? Inter that's interesting. <clears throat> yeah. Rick Boda was a great DP. Christian Wagner, the production designer, had also designed um, uh, Surviving the Game for me. Oh, okay. Now, of all those producers that, that were in it, the, the only ones I really had dealings with were uh, Joel Silver in the beginning. Okay. And um, uh, Richard Donner oh, okay. later on in editing. Hmm. And I had been a big fan of Donner's for a long time. I always loved his Superman. Oh, yeah. And then the, the Lethal Weapon films. And the Omen, you know. Oh, he, yeah. He did the Omen, so. Well, he could, do a pretty, he could pretty much do anything, really. Yeah. And a really nice guy. Really cool gentleman. So where was this location here, the exterior... For the, the this is all this is all Saugus also. Okay. Um, it was uh, it was a good desert location. It wasn't too far of a drive out mm -hmm. from L.A. Um, since this movie is set almost entirely at night, I didn't want to be shooting forty nights. I just thought it would be harmful to the crew. That you reach a point of uh, diminishing returns. Mm -hmm. So we shot uh, several nights with the, the chase on the road um, outside the uh, the diner. And then later on, we moved into a, a decommissioned airline, air, air, aircraft hangar at uh, Van Nuys Airport. And that's where we shot the, the bulk of the movie. Oh, okay. It was better because we could... We could show up for work at 7 a.m. And, and go home at 7 p.m. and still get the feeling that we shot all night. <laughs> yeah, you didn't have to be night owls or anything. No. Dick Miller. Oh, yeah. I was so happy to get Dick Miller for this movie. Um, he's Dick Miller is a guy that I grew up with. I mean, I grew up seeing Roger Corman films. Oh, yeah, we all grew I mean, everybody's grown up with Dick, man. I mean, he's a legend. yeah. Such a cool gentleman, very, very cool gentleman. And uh, and he still looks great. 
Oh yeah, he's still kicking. I mean, and what's amazing about this is one of the I think one of the best parts he got in the later part of his career, aside from the stuff he did with Joe Dante, because you really gave him some great stuff to play in this movie. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was good to work with him, you know, in in a in an extended capacity. It was a lot of fun, and then Gary Farmer and John Shuck. Oh yeah, and then here he comes. Oh man, he. I, I gotta say, he looks like he was having an absolute blast playing this guy. You know, when Billy showed up, you know, we we knew of uh, the movies, and when he showed up, whenever I saw Billy in the movies, always he always had a full head of hair. Mm -hmm. So so when he showed up, <laughs> when he showed up to meet with us, he was bald, <laughs> and he and he had and he had this case, and he opened up the case, and he had all these hair pieces in it. <laughs> and he was, and he says, so uh, which one of these do you think I should use? And and I'm looking at him, I'm looking at him, I said, you know, man, I think you should just stay bald. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's the best look for you. Now this, this here was shot in our, in our aircraft hangar. Okay. It was all indoors. This is some of John Van Fleet's uh, visual effects there. Ah, oh, okay. And uh, old school effects. This was these were in the days before CGI. Yeah. So yeah, because yeah. Jurassic Park was only like two years old at this point, and you know that was the, kind of the kickoff point for a lot of that stuff. So yeah, you're doing it old school, man. Yeah. I mean, you'll see later on that that some of the effects are really really old school. We have glass paintings, mm -hmm. glass mat shots, uh, model work, um, and then when the demons come it was just a uh, great makeup design and execution by todd masters and his crew yeah yeah i was gonna we'll certainly be talking a lot about todd's work in this because it's that was one thing watching the film again recently i was like wow his work just it's amazingly detailed and it holds up extremely well mm -hmm. cc yeah cc was so cool now when i read the script I always pictured Geraldine as a, as a little tough lady. Mm -hmm. And I had just seen Jada in um, Menace to Society. Right, right. And I thought she did a really, really good job. And um, I think Joel had someone else in mind for this. Mm -hmm. But I, I talked to him about Jada and convinced him about Jada. And uh, contacted her and brought her in. And uh, and uh, we got her, and I think she was so cool. Now, the funny thing about it, when I met Jada, you know, her hair is brown. Mm -hmm. And I say that <laughs> because something's going to happen up here. So when Jada shows up, she had dyed her hair blonde. <laughs> And it was white. It was like platinum. Oh, really? White. Wow. You know? And she called me up. She says, uh, I hope I didn't screw things up. I dyed my hair blonde. I said, you what? <laughs> I said, could you come over here? And, and she came over to my house so I could look at it. And it was it was white. And, you know, and I said, do me a favor. I like the idea, but but just make it more yellow. You know, put make it more blondish. Yeah. You know, it's definitely a statement because it's definitely not her hair. It's definitely a fashion statement. Mm -hmm. Mr. Flesher, Charles Flesher, yeah. great, really cool gentleman. Great actor. Uh, we don't see enough of him. No, yeah, you hear enough. I mean, obviously, as the voice of Roger Rabbit is what he's best known for. But I mean, and I watching the movie again, I was, I had forgotten he has a really kind of tragic arc to his character here. He's a, mm -hmm. he's very sad and very I, I, he does a really nice understated job with this character. Yeah, he does. Oh, Brenda Backey I had seen in a uh, in a, a Japanese science fiction film mm. that she did about a giant robot, and she played a a, a mercenary, and um, just a really good actress. It was it was a it was a great ensemble that we were able to put together here. And uh, everybody just just jumped into it. Everybody had a ball with it. Well, the movie was cast very smartly because when you have a whole bunch of people in a tight space together for an entire 
movie, they all have to be distinctive or they're all going to blend together. And you got, there's no mistaking any two of these people for anybody else. This entire set was designed and constructed by Christian Wagner um, as an exterior to be seen from one angle mm -hmm. and then the, and then the, the full interior. Uh, so we were able to shoot uh, interiors and exteriors all in the same place. Uh, he built a little a, a countryside and a forced perspective that moved away from uh, the the hotel, the house, and and we gave it a history. We made it a hotel that had once been a uh, a, a church. So it, it wasn't just your normal everyday hotel motel. It uh, it had a history. It used to have um, another function. So that gave us a chance to do, you know, bigger windows like the ones behind Bill there and have the interior be a little bit more uh, cavernous. Mm -hmm. yeah, never could, what is he eating exactly? I've never been able to figure that out. <laughs> It's, uh, I think in reality, I think it was like mushroom soup. Yeah, because uh, he puts ketchup all and, over and, it. I'm like, that's yes, an odd choice. <laughs> <laughs> what's else? Well, you know, what's, what's really interesting, um, the thing about Breaker, and you realize why later, there's, there's a lot of things that are kind of anachronistic about him. Look mm -hmm. at his hairstyle. Oh, yeah, sure. His hairstyle. His hairstyle is definitely one from an earlier, an earlier time. Mm hmm uh, there was a time when, when, when guys used to put ketchup on everything, you know, just to, just to give it that taste. And it's those, it's those little details that really come into play later on when you find out how old he really is. Right, right. That that hairstyle was probably something he wore in World War One. Mm -hmm. You expecting somebody, Mr. Smith? Evening, motel people. And here comes Thomas Hayden Church. Oh, yeah. And I think this was one of the first films he ever did, um, if not the first. And uh, we had a lot of fun with that. He's, 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 an, he's very, a, very, a very versatile actor because he can play an incredibly kind of spacey, dim-witted person like he did on Wings, but then turn around and play someone like this, and you buy it in, in, in immediately. He's, you know, and he's gone, of course, he's gone on to have a, a really successful career and Oscar nomination for Sideways and everything. Yeah, yeah. That's really good for him. Poor Wally. But yeah, he's just... <laughs> What I, what I like about the movie, and obviously we'll get to it later, is that you can't really predict who's going to make it out of this thing. You you don't set up any obvious, like, well, there's, of course, the he'll make it out because he's a nice guy, or the kid's going to make it out because the kids always make it out. You you don't play by those rules here. No, I actually tried to subvert those rules. Um, you know, I wanted Jada because I just thought she would be a good, feisty, young heroin but uh but the fact that she's african american usually in movies like this they're the first folks to die <laughs> <laughs> black folks are the first folks to go so i was hoping that i would get the audience to think oh she's not going to last too long mm -hmm. and um and you don't know what happens to who yeah you wouldn't know you you, you have no idea what's going to happen to who you're right and the people, even when you think they're dead, like CC manages to hold on for quite a while, <laughs> despite all that happens yeah. to her. Stealing. Okay. And everybody's. Oh, yeah, and everybody's just everybody's on edge, yeah. Everybody's showing up. Yeah, everybody's showing up. So how tricky is it to work with an ensemble like this when you have, like in this scene where you have all your characters 
in the scene pretty much at one time. How difficult is it to sort of balance everything out and get the coverage that you need, especially on a film where you don't have a whole lot of time to shoot? You got to, you know, kind of run and gun it for a lot and get it done. Well, actually, this was a film that I did have a reasonably decent schedule. I think we had 40 days to shoot this in. Oh, okay. Um, which the way I'm used to working was, was, a, was a very generous schedule. Right, yeah. But, um, you know, you just make sure you hit all the beats. Uh, you know, you get in there in the morning and you work out the blocking with the actors. Um, I, don't, I don't recall having a feeling of being rushed mm -hmm. a lot. I mean, you know, you, you're, you're always rushed to a certain extent in, in that you have to keep a schedule, keep to a schedule. But in, I don't recall making any compromises on this film. Uh, the producers were really good, our First AD and our producers were good at uh, putting together a schedule that uh, that worked. And our pre-production period, everything was worked out ahead of time. The effects were worked out. Uh, it was, uh, by the time we went to camera, we pretty much knew what we were going to be doing. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you're talking about. Don't give me that camera. Where is it? Baby's up in his room. And also it helps that you're basically just in one location in a, in a essentially a studio, although it was an airplane hangar, so you don't have to go out on location. You can, you know, you're just staying in one place. Yeah. I mean, the, the challenge is you're, since you're photographing one place over and over and over again, how do you keep, how do you keep it interesting? So always trying to find ways of, of, of keeping the space interesting and not, not so you get bored. Gary, Gary Farmer was so funny. He's such a great guy. And his, I love... Uh, yeah, he's, not, he's another character he's I would not have thought would have lasted as long as he does in the movie. Because usually mm -hmm. a guy like this is either the first or the second to go. Yeah. Right now, the voice of authority is the sheriff. Mm -hmm. and he's probably our hero. Freeze! Oh. Bitch. That had to be an interesting scene to put together. <laughs> <laughs> now, this was a great case of uh, improvisation because I think it was uh, I think it was Gary who came up with the line. <laughs> it was it's almost like a tune up in a lube job. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, with improvisation, it, it, do you find that on the films that you, that you really encourage it, and do you think that there's ever a downside to it at any point? Actually, sure. It was kind of like a tune-up and a loop job. <laughs> um, you know, you have to you have to monitor it, you know, and, you know, and see if it works. Does it work? Mm -hmm. You know, um, sometimes actors, since they inhabit the characters that they you know that they're that they're creating you know and and learn to think like those characters sometimes they can come up with something more in line with what that character might say uh or you know just a different way of saying it i'm if possible i'm always trying to find ways of of making it making the dialogue fit the actor who's who's saying those lines so if he has if he's more comfortable saying it in a different way um, I'm cool with that. A lot of television shows aren't comfortable with that. They they want it word for word. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, sometimes actors come up with a more interesting way of saying it. But the thing you don't want to change is the context of what's being said. And there it is, the, the key. The key. Great prop. Who designed the key? Uh, that came out of Christian's, um, uh, uh, production design studio. Hmm. I don't, rem I'm, I'm, I think it was Christian that showed me the first drawings of it. Christian Wagner, my production designer. Right. Out to the car. Sheriff, I have to say I am much obliged for your assistance in apprehending this. By this time, you know. It's just kind of like settling in. Yeah. And 
I, I'm a big student of Hitchcock. Mm -hmm. And the best way to make a moment of horror work is to lull the audience into a false sense of security. So they almost get bored. Mm -hmm. And then... Boom. And I actually thought it was interesting. That when I first saw this in the theater, that scared me because you hit it a couple beats before you feel it's going to happen. You, you know, it was just kind of like, oh, I wasn't expecting that a little. I was expecting just a little bit more of a draw out, but you, it was like you went, no, 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 we're just going to kick this thing into high gear. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, uh, I remember reading about a, a great conversation between uh, William Wyler and uh, David Lean, two great directors, uh, and they were talking to each other, hey, do, in 1960, they were talking about having both just seen Psycho. Mm -hmm. And the conversation was like, did you see that movie Psycho? He said, yeah, what about that shower scene? Wasn't that brilliant? And the other one said, I think what was more brilliant was everything that happened before the shower scene. Mm -hmm. Because it does, it sets you up for one thing. He's so funny here. You fucking hold up, hold up. Well, they in there, motherfucker! <laughs> <laughs> now, he made that up. Oh, he did, okay. He imp yeah, he improvised that. <laughs> that was totally Billy Zane. <laughs> <laughs> this property... Is hereby condemned. Well, it's interesting with Billy because I've, you know, when he's like, kind of lets his freak flag fly in, in certain movies like this or in Dead Calm, he's absolutely riveting. I mean, yeah. he's just he's he's a very quirky actor in a lot of ways, and I don't think a lot of films really take advantage of that. This one certainly does. Uh, yeah. Well, we wanted the we wanted that character to have his own personality mm -hmm. and to be interesting the villain should always be the most interesting person in a movie yeah now this is old school we shot all these in reverse right and in a cut with the uh we built these little uh these little baby demons in various stages of their development So Todd Masters had worked uh, on the sh the original uh, Tales from the Crypt series quite a bit. Was that how he got picked for this? And what was your working relationship with him like? Todd was great. Uh, yeah, actually, a lot of the crew had already worked on the series. Rick Boda, the cinematographer, mm -hmm. had worked on the series. Uh, I brought some of my own people on, like uh, Christian, the production designer, uh, Phil Odeker was my camera operator from uh, New York, and he came on and operated, our A camera operator. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot, of the, a lot of the crew had already done the uh, uh, Tales from the Crypt TV series. Now, what's interesting is that in the original script, those demons looked more like the people they used to be. Oh, okay. They were more, they were more human. Um, but then, you know, just as the, in pre-production, as the development kept going on, we wanted to really come up with a new kind of a monster. Mm -hmm. And the idea of these demons, they always had the, the thing where the only way to kill them was to shoot out their eyes. Right. To release their souls. But I can honestly say I'm proud that I said, okay, after you shoot out their eyes, it can't be that easy. Right. Shoot out their eyes and you got a duck. <laughs> so that was my because the souls come shooting out and if it hits you, boom, yeah, it could kill you. And I like the way that you shoot them because they're, they're not. You don't really ever get a long, protracted glimpse at them. There, there's, you see, you know, little bits and pieces here, and you get a couple of sideways glances. And I think. Is that, a, is that a solid approach for you with uh, filming effects and makeups and creatures? Is that the less you see, in many ways, the better off you are? Yeah, well, these demons were always going to be lit, so they're always like semi-silhouettes. Mm -hmm. They're always going to be in the dark so that their eyes can, the glow of the eyes could come through. Um, and the fast cuts, yeah, because you don't want to see the works. They were a really great bunch of uh, performers 
who were performing on um, on his little leg extension stilts, mm. wearing a diaper that <laughs> had a radio controlled tail that was being manipulated by uh, a, a special effects tech right out of the frame, and. Um, you know, it's always best to keep a little bit of mystery there so you don't really see it. So there's, there's still some questions about what they really, really look like. Mm -hmm. And we put little details in it like uh, the body piercings. Now, I've often been asked by some people if this is where Peter Jackson got the idea for the orcs <laughs> from uh, Lord of the Rings. And I said, I don't know. They do look like orcs. They got a little, yeah, there's a little, a little similarity there, definitely. Yeah. They look kind of like a combination of orcs and the Crypt Keeper, actually. They've got some of that look going on yeah. for them. But if this was inspiring the orcs, then I'm pleased yeah. to have well. helped in some way with Lord of the Rings. Poor Wally. Yeah, but, yeah, and then I, want, I, I, yeah. I love the, uh, is, uh, you can only say poor Wally, but then you learn the secret about the character later on, yeah. which I really liked. I thought that was a neat little, it's like, oh, well, he was kind of messed up. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was in the script. That was a real, uh, that, that was a real laugh. Were the screenwriters on the set with you? Um... No, they didn't. I think they came probably to the set maybe uh, once or twice. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we started changing the concept of the demons, um, I believe they they executed those changes. Um, but no, for the most part, they didn't come on set. And uh, the person that was there day by day as a as a producer was Gil mm -hmm. to make sure everything was running smoothly. Right. Um, and he had a lot of other things to deal with. But uh, Joel Silver was out of the country most of the time. He had another film someplace else he was dealing with. Mm -hmm. So they pretty much let us alone. Mm. They just want you and that thing you're carrying. I say we give it to them. And I say they'll kill you anyway. Or possess you, or use you to get to the rest of us. Now, like it or not, we stick together. My cat's outside. I gotta get my cat. You go out, you stay out. Is that so? What are you gonna do? Shoot us? Right in the eyes. Yeah, you're gonna shoot us? Right in the eyes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Bill was serious. He, um, he, he has such expressive eyes. Oh, yeah. Such an expressive face. Yeah. And uh, and and he had fun with it, you know. He started improvising some little bits, like you know, being attacked by a demon one too many times. <laughs> he just goes, "Oh man!" <laughs> yes. <laughs> that has, has added resonance later when you realize just how long he's been doing this. Yeah. So there's um there's a flashback coming up. And uh, that was um, another instance of our old school. <laughs> yeah, I was definitely wanted to ask about the flashback because it's, it's a very interesting imagery you got going on in there. Now, this was Gerilyn's room. The, the thing we established about Gerilyn in the script was that she always wanted to travel. She was a girl who was stuck in this little town who always wanted to travel the world. Mm-hmm. So here we go. And this was on stage. This wide angle was actually a uh, a glass shot that was uh that was uh, painted by Rocco Joffrey. Hmm. One of the great map painters from ILM. Oh wow. And uh we did that in the studio and uh, it just extended the sky by with a with the glass shot. Oh, okay. So you know, glass shots are one of the oldest visual effects. Oh yeah, yeah. In movies, and the thing is, it looks so good. I mean, you know, 
what well, even if you had digital technology been it wouldn't have looked any better than that yeah, I wanted a, a stylized, because we had discussed possibly doing it on location, but I wanted a more stylized look. Mm -hmm. um, I had just seen a movie called, uh, a, a Hong Kong film called The Bride with White Hair. Oh, yeah. And um, there's an early scene, early scenes when um, this young kid is growing up, and they were staged against backdrops that were just beautifully done. And since it's memory... Uh, I figured, you know, we could have a little bit of fun with the reality mm -hmm. and play it as a more non-real, slightly stylized situation. Well, well, well. Isn't this sweet? The, soil dove the guy you love to hate. Yeah, I like the fact you don't give any false redemption to the character. He really is just a prick from the beginning to all the way to the end. Yeah. You know, he doesn't learn his lesson. He doesn't have a hidden heart of gold. He's just a jerk. The idea in the script was that um, each person's downfall was going to be predicated by their weakness, whatever weakness that they had. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the thing that uh, the collector was able to do, was to just find your weakness and and present it to you in a way and then you would become the embodiment of that weakness in, in a more demonic form so i'll kind of ex you know run through that as we go through the film right now i was curious about the the film is essentially a, a this is a siege picture i mean everyone's trapped and they're finding something from it. were you a fan of like uh, the films of john carpenter like salt on precinct 13 because in many ways this film reminds me of movies like that oh yeah um the thing i love the thing oh yeah uh, yeah. uh the original night of the living dead uh assault on precinct 13 uh prince of darkness Oh, you know, I love her. yeah, that's yeah. You know, all those uh, Carpenter films where people are trapped. It's um, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a scary situation. But I mean, you know, the th I can honestly say, yeah, the thing was definitely in the back of my mind somewhere while we were making this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, also films like Alien. Oh sure. Uh, and um, and uh, Aliens. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so being trapped in this uh, in this environment and having to fight your way out, it's 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 just makes for like much more concentrated storytelling. Mm -hmm. You're trapped, and how do you get out? And it does have a tendency to amp up the tension because it's a pressure cooker. Everyone's reacting to the situation differently, and the longer it goes on, the more stressed out everybody gets. And that offers you as a director a lot of dramatic possibilities with how you stage certain scenes. But also people are getting on each other's nerves. Right. <laughs> and, um, and, it, and it gives you a chance to reveal the flaws in each, each character. You know, they're, 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 they're messing with each other. Look at, look at him. He just slapped her. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, just, um, you know, because she stood up for herself and uh, but, you know, that character is a coward. But, you know, but that's it. Everybody's fighting each other as well as as well as the uh, the bigger danger. What was the budget on this movie? Do you remember? I think it was probably in the area around 10, probably okay. around 10 million, I believe. That's pretty good for a film like this, actually. See, so it's pretty, a pretty uh, decent number. So you probably did have more resources than, uh, than you would normally think for something like this. Because, I mean, 10 million back 20 years ago is probably closer to about 30 or so now. Mm-hmm. And we had time. I mean, you know, that, mm -hmm. that 10 million bought us, uh, uh, I believe it was a 40 day shooting schedule, which was, which was pretty good. 
Now, this is how the collector is able to come on to Cordelia and really try to make this as eerie as possible. It was an interesting, an interesting problem in special effects, how to touch somebody from a distance mm -hmm. without actually touching them. Right. Yeah, it's true, because you need to convey that he's actually influencing her beyond just making a presentation, that he's actually kind of infecting her soul and getting access to her through this this sort of, you know, kind of appearance that he's making to her. Mm -hmm. And the color change we just did going from the dominant blue to a more uh, sunlighty, mm -hmm. golden light. So I wanted uh, him to be able to wipe her tears without actually wiping them because he couldn't because he's down there. So we used air. Hmm. We used little jets of air in a hose that because he brushes her hair back and and now he's going to wipe the tears away. And then rub her lips. Mm. But it took a long time to get the right take. Really? Because air, you know, is still a little uncontrollable. So, Yeah, it's hard to direct air. Mm. It doesn't do what you want. No. And again, I, I you know, if you're a watcher of the genre and you sit down and you you watch a movie like this, you have certain expectations. I was like, oh, these are the, the, the you know, the, the poor guy loves this woman and she's sensitive and she likes him. Now you think, oh, maybe they'll find their way towards each other, but not in this movie. No. Uh, not, not here. You really love me, don't you, Wally? Yes, Cordelia. And Wally's finally close to her. <laughs> And he's all, and he's finally gonna get what he's always dreamed about, if for only a moment. <laughs> As a cinematographer, I mean, that was your background coming up before you became a director. Was it? How was it working with another cinematographer like Rick Boda on this film? Did you have? Did you were you able to give him a lot of creative freedom, and were you two pretty much on the same page as to how you wanted this movie shot? Yeah, we were on the same page. I mean, the great thing about having once been a cinematographer is that I can speak the language, right? And uh, we can talk pretty and pretty much in depth about what I want and 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 how we can do it and and play with ideas. So. Um, so it, 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 it actually makes it much more fun. Mm -hmm. Now, this Cordelia demon was not the original idea for the demon that we had. Since okay. Cordelia was a, was a prostitute, I thought that her mouth should actually be like a vertical slit that was in her stomach out of which would open up with teeth and a tongue come out. Ah. So basically it would be a vagina dentalis. <laughs> but uh, the, the wife of one of the producers read that and said, no way you're putting that in this movie. <laughs> so as a result, oh. she became this, you know, more ordinary type of monster. But that other idea was more in keeping with who she was, you know, how, her weakness. And <laughs> the, the eyeballs made it out, so he has to shoot the little eyeballs there. Yeah. <gasps> Go ahead. Oh. Oh, give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> Cece was so cool. I love that lady. 
how difficult was it for her to play the scenes where her she did she have to she must have had her had her arm tucked back at a pretty odd angle for some of the shots in the movie. Yeah, it was it was like a whole thing with uh, pipes and hoses going up her arm and everything. And actually, somebody mm-hmm. took a picture of my my daughter Janet was visiting the set the day that we uh, that we did that. <laughs> Somebody actually took a picture of her sitting in the director's chair with the with watching Cece's arm coming off, and my daughter was <laughs> was chewing bubble gum because she's blowing a bubble while she's watching it on the monitor. <laughs> <laughs> and it was funny, but Cece was uh, she was game. You could, she she just had a ball doing it, you know. Everybody uh, and look how she just continues to play with the twitches. <laughs> And I think we see her with the vodka bottle in her hand for pretty much the rest of the picture. Yeah. And half her arm. <laughs> so fuck you. I'm going. Let's go. So, you know, working with uh, Rick, uh, the cinematographer, you know, the idea mm-hmm. was definitely let's light the scene all with flashlights, you know, with the smoke okay. and everything. And you make sure you got some bounce cards off camera to, like, catch the flashlight bounce and bounce it back into faces and stuff. So, you know, those are decisions you make early on. Right. Knowing what it's going to give you. Did a lot of uh, experimenting with uh, speed ramp changes in this mm-hmm. film. Now, how the script you said was pretty much had been changed a few times. Did it go through any other major changes while you were filming? Um, major change, uh, yeah, uh, especially towards the end. Um, and when we get there, I'll talk about that. But uh, uh, a lot of material was cut. There was um, there was a little bit more material that really got into uh, the little boy Danny and his parents. Mm. And we actually did shoot a little bit more of Danny interacting with his parents inside the diner. Oh, but okay. we, but I think we cut it because of time. Um. Uh, towards the end, um, we made a major change, definitely in the ending of the, of the, of the show, because, uh, really what we wanted to do, uh, just wasn't possible with the technology at the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll talk about, I'll talk about that later. Sure. But this, um... This sequence in the script was uh, longer, a little bit more involved, more of a journey through the tunnels. But, uh, and we did shoot a lot more. But in editing, um, Steve and I just decided to just, you know, really just cut it down quite a bit, get to Danny sooner. Mm Mm-hmm. Because one of the things that that really works in horror is if horrible things happen to people that you know, that you have some sort of relationship with. Right. And in the original script, Danny's parents turning, who are the ones that the demons that attack our are, are heroes later. Mm-hmm. You know, you really kind of felt that because um, uh, you, you got to know them a little bit. But now the only time you see them is... Um, is in the beginning when they run out when uh, Breaker was trying to uh, break into uh, the car. Right. Yeah, the story is a little bit more involved about how Danny got there. Danny, is that you? Danny, how the hell did you get down here? Come on. Come on, Danny, I'm not going to hurt you. 
I promise. Come on. Come on. I was going to ask about that because it did, I remember watching it, it seemed like he just sort of popped up and we'd almost forgotten about him at that point. Mm hmm. Yeah, it was, there was more to it, but it probably would have lengthened the movie by about another 15 minutes. Right, right. And that's got to be difficult for you as a director, certainly not just on this movie, but on any film, to lose scenes and stuff that you know would be helpful and, and build character. But when the movie, when the roller coaster's on its way down or it's building, a tension's building in a certain scene, you just have to lose stuff. Yeah. Because you got to keep it moving. Don't worry. There was an argument between Roach and Danny's father. Mm -hmm. This is for four years of minimum wage, you asshole. And that's where this line came from. This was for four years of minimum wage because he was complaining about how much he was being paid. So those are the, you know, those are the things that, um, that you go through a lot of heavy discussion on. You know, uh, can we lose this? Right. Do we really need this? You know, do we need this shot? Do we need this scene? Was anything deleted from the final version of the movie that you did shoot? Or was it pretty much everything that you shot was in the film to one degree or another? Um, like I said, the uh, there was a, a scene in the diner between uh, Danny's father and, and Roach. Uh, mm -hmm. That was cut. Uh, just to stick with Breaker to get, you know, stay with Breaker more. Um, um, trying to think. Yeah, there were some trims here and there. Um, it's been a long time. I'm trying to remember some more specifics, <laughs> but uh, but it's tough. Hey, Danny. How you doing? Listen, what were you doing down in the mines? He came back. Yeah. And he got my parents. Now, in terms of the violence in the film, obviously there's a lot in it, but it's very stylized, kind of over-the-top comic book violence. Did you have any problems with the ratings board in terms of getting an R rating, or were you able to leave pretty much everything in? I think, uh, well, we left just about everything in. Um, the only censorship problem came from... Uh, the producer's wife that didn't want the vagina dentalis <laughs> in the movie. Um, but uh, everything else was uh, pretty much left as is. Um, I think we may have had to cut some frames out of uh, CeCe's arm being torn off, maybe. Oh, okay. And now this is uh, our World War I set. And this is where we find out a little bit more about Breaker. They drew us right in on the goddamn ambush. What are you doing? We got to get out of here. The real battle is ahead. Sir, I don't, I don't understand. Now take it. I also realize they, they, the key makes an appearance in the next uh, Tales from the Crypt movie, the Bordello of Blood, as well. Yeah, from what I understand, it wasn't originally going to be in it. Oh, really? Yeah, from what I understand, it was uh, during the first preview screenings, people were expecting Bordello of Blood to be a continuation of a, of a Demon Knight type of story. Oh, okay. And uh, it wasn't, and I think they went back and added the key. Oh, okay. To make it fit better. Because this movie actually did pretty well when it came out, if I remember correctly. It was a pretty successful uh, theatrical release, wasn't it? Yeah, it did. I think it opened up at number two that opening weekend. Um, and I'm always amazed at the love that people show this film. You know, when you get to know a movie and you know it so well that you know all of its warts and, mm -hmm. and what... You wanted to work, but didn't work, and stuff like that. You know, um, 
the audience doesn't have that knowledge and and just to find out the people love this movie so much that it's continuously surprising to me does it get brought up with you often because i mean you've written you've done so many things uh uh you know even before this and then since since this movie came out but is this still a film that comes up to in your with fan interactions and other people and other filmmakers often yeah yeah uh a lot more recently actually um mm. more recently people tell me how they've gone back and looked at demon night and said you know i always love that movie you know and uh, <laughs> I said, oh wow thank you and i've had people email me and tell me how much uh, they're looking forward to the Blu-ray release of this. So, Cool. Yeah. That's good to hear. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Let there be light. And there was light. And he scattered the demons. And he scattered the keys. All across the universe. And so we, now we have the uh, exposition portion of the, of the movie. Yeah, I just wanted to make it more visual because uh, in the script, he, he basically tells the story. And I wanted to go in over his shoulder and go down and really do a montage of, of the demons. So, you know, I was always trying to get extra shots of demons in silhouettes as more impressionist, more impressionistic images mm -hmm. um, that I could put into that. You know, those shots that you grab whenever you can. Right. And uh, so we were able to make it into a little montage. Bad neck wound. Talon caught the artery here. Most of what's in here now belonged to a soldier named Dickerson. Gave it to me in France, August 23rd, 1917. So my name got in here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, was, <laughs> yeah. That was the soldier that was dying on the World War I battlefield. He must be an old cousin or something. Mm -hmm. And Bill played this beautifully. I like the way he finishes it. So, now you know. Yep. So. Now you know. You feel better? <laughs> no. <laughs> not, not really. really. Not particularly, no. <laughs> Yeah, that's the look on everyone's face. It's like, yeah, I would say feeling better is not really part of it. No, it's... Uh... <laughs> yeah. And Uncle Willie wishes he had that bottle of vodka down. Yeah, I've always... Sandler's one of my favorite character actors because he can do really, like, intensely evil and, and cruel characters very well, but then turn around and turn in, you know, a very soulful character with a lot of, uh, a lot of heart very easily. And it's not a lot of actors can do that. And the character that he played in Shawshank, oh yeah, with, with, with his little stutter. I mean, I, I, he's. I think he's. Uh, he's he's one of our underutilized great actors, great American actors. He's uh, and he loves his work. You know, he just loves to work, and and he and he always has an approach. Comes in with stuff. Do me a favor. Don't scream. Oh, here we go with her. Yep. His seduction of her because she wants to travel right that was one of the things that that, that was a a beat and some dialogue that got cut okay. you know where we explained that you know she was just so frustrated with being in this little town she wanted to get out and travel the world and then <laughs> there she is she can you know he's offering her the chance to travel the chance to see the world So yeah. what what were your experiences working with Jada like overall? I mean, she was at an interesting stage in her career at this point. She was relatively new, but certainly getting a lot of attention, obviously because of Menace to Society and other films. And then shortly after this, she really kind of exploded. Yeah, she was great. She, you know, very professional, you know, nice lady, cool lady. Um, and uh, given a chance to play... Uh, a heroine, you know, a, a lady of action, someone who becomes a lady of action. This was actually shot looking straight down. Oh, okay. That shot of uh, when they're eating Bill. Hell, I'd rather it wasn't. All right, I know what you're thinking. 
So it's just, it's just, he shows up without any hair, and then she shows up with blonde hair. With so you had a hair. couple of, hair. <laughs> yeah, you had some hair, you had some hair issues on this movie initially, but it worked out good. Yeah, it worked out fine. Has anyone ever told you how pretty you are? It was definitely a different look for her. I never sound like I'm mm-hmm. or never used it, but I mean it. You know, I can see to it that you're so pretty. I don't think she's used it again at, uh, since. I don't think she's used it again since. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think, I think you're right. Do we have a deal? <laughs> Something tells me you don't trust me. That's all right. We'll work on that. You will give me what I want. So the big question is, did he get to her? Well, you set that up well because with what happened with Brenda earlier, you realize the power that this guy has. So... Mm-hmm. You know, now it's just like, uh oh. And then this shot here. Yeah, because she's walk, she's she's mm-hmm. almost like walking in a trance. So you're just like, is she already been taken over here? Anything? Where's Uncle Willie? I haven't seen his wrinkled butt neither. <laughs> Cece's doing fine without her arm. She's seemed yeah. to recover pretty good here. It's that vodka. That vodka kicked <laughs> in. <laughs> and now we want to know, did she get it? God or what? She was funny. Willie, you son of a bitch! <laughs> Everybody's drinking in the oh, there's a little little tales from the crypt cameo there. I like. Yeah. I wanted to de- when we come to it, I wanted to definitely talk about the comic book scene. Yeah, the way it cuts back and forth is really clever. But getting well, it is well. Well, actually, yeah. When we get there, we can talk about it because it was actually kind of a satire on um, all the all the conservative backlash that the that the comic book used to get back in the days when it was out oh, there. Oh sure, yeah. 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 The code. Like, like, and like all it's that, yeah. yeah, like it's uh, destroying the minds of our children, turning our children into Ooh. demons. This this was improvised. <sighs> <laughs> that was totally improvised. Thomas was up there and he was saying, you know, man, I'm up here. I just want to spit on him. <laughs> and I said, okay, let's do that. You know, and and then, you know, and, and I said, okay, you spit on what if what if it hey, they hate that, you know. So we incorporated that into the uh Okay. I gotta ask, how did uh, did Dick enjoy his time on this particular scene? <laughs> yeah, you know, we had to shoot this two different ways. We had to shoot this with uh oh clothed and yeah that's with right tops yeah. and then topless for the uh the broadcast but this is uncle <laughs> willie's downfall and yeah and dick does some things in it that are beautiful show what a what a good act <laughs> what a good actor <laughs> he is suck this one down uncle willie long hard one Nothing gets you fucked up faster. Am I right? Because <laughs> yeah. the look on his face. Yeah. When he takes a drink. He's damned and he knows it. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, he, just, doing him. and he just basically says, fuck it. Yeah. Just the look on his face. I think Dick played it's, this beautifully. He does because he knows he's, he's, he knows he's screwed. But yeah. It's just like he's, he's helpless to do anything he, he about it. He can't do anything about it, yeah. Yeah, he's gone. Yeah. We don't have too many people like Dick Miller left. No. Jesus Christ, those post office folks were right. You son of a bitch. This guy was reading all our mail. What the hell? Shit. Well, he was crazy or not. Good night, Bob. And here we find out about Wally. Yeah, that was, I was like, oh man, like <laughs> he's going to take, nice... take out the yeah, post, take out the post office like, for Cadelia. Yeah, I thought that again. I really thought that was a neat beat because it's like, oh, he was that poor little nerdy guy with the crush on the on the bad girl, you know. And then, oh, it turns out he was really kind of out of his mind. Yeah, Willie. Oh yeah! We got a...
Was Dick okay with the makeup though, or was he hand, did he handle uh, it pretty well? Because he was already pretty, you know, getting up there at this point. Yeah, but Dick's but Dick's a pro, man. He's a pro. Uh, he he was just so cool. Yeah, he he was good with it. This was cold, <laughs> cold blooded, cold blooded. <laughs> the poached appendage. <laughs> yeah. Nice transition where he just kind of disappears. Like a lot, a lot of old school in camera tricks and just cutting between a pan to black. Nice job on that. Just, yeah, you know, just um, trying to find what works. I mean, you know, we had uh, Dick had these contact lenses and we used. Um, uh, this lighting system that um, makes them glow. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they, they had a, like a fluorescent type paint in them, I think. Oh, okay. If I remember correctly. This shot was was difficult because with the leg extensions on, it was hard for our demons to walk upstairs. Oh, I bet, yeah. And and they they practiced that quite a lot but it was it was hard i mean some of their movements were limited than what they could do but they did a really good job with uh with their limitations well it gives them an unusual gait so it doesn't it strikes you as being very alien and very not human that's not like a normal human would walk so those leg extensions really give those creatures a very distinctive feel mm-hmm That's what he said. Oh man! <laughs> <laughs> and I think uh, I think Bill uh, ad lived that. You know? Can I say, oh, okay. oh man? He said, "There's another time of being grabbed by something." Right. I said, I said "Go for it, man." It's probably not the first time in his life that he's had to face a headless body coming after him. Sadly. No. <laughs> so I wanted to talk a little bit about the the score that Ed Shearmer did. Uh, how much interaction did you have with him? Because he did a wonderful job on this. Yeah, he did. Um, I was there for some of the scoring, but not all of it. Around this time, I was. Mm -hmm. We shot this film in Los Angeles, and I was still living on the East Coast at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was kind of back and forth. Now that was Billy. That was Bill. That was Billy's idea. Trying to figure out, well, where's it going to come from? He said, "What if I just put it in my mouth?" And he showed it to me, and I said, "Okay, let's do it." He's a bossy asshole, isn't he? Though. Billy was, um, you know, great to work with, a great ally because he was determined to make this a good movie. He wanted to make it the best movie he could. And he was always coming up with ideas. And even when some bad ideas came down from up high um, that he knew that I wasn't crazy with, um, you know, he, he backed me up. And we found ways of, of making everything work. So there were times the studio kind of wanted you to do certain things you didn't want to do? In the ending, the ending was uh, was problematical because uh, there was a lot of R&D in trying to figure out how to pull it off. See, now that lady walking up the steps, those folks walking up the steps and those demon legs, they worked hard to just do see. that. I, yeah, I, now that I'm looking at it... Uh, <laughs> Come on, Baker, move your ass. Grab the case and get on over here. And you got a little beat here that reminds me a little bit of a uh, scene from Aliens. Mm -hmm. When uh with uh, Vasquez in the in the air conditioning vent when she's Oh yeah. Decides, she, I was like we're not going to make it out of here, so let's let's take some with us. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yep, she's still saving that cat. I love this. I, I love her devotion to the cat, man. Yeah. So. 
down. I want you all up in the steeple now. What are you going to do? I'm going to cover the rear. Get your asses up there. Go! Up, 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 up. This is my house. I make the rules. Now get up there. I wouldn't, you know, argue with a one one armed woman with a grenade, a bunch of grenades strapped around her neck. I don't. <laughs> no. I, I would just do it. No. And I always like this. They're gonna go out together. Yep. All right, let's get them. Ah, oh, it's a great shot. <laughs> So now they're trapped in the attic. And his and weakness is the comic book. Comic book. And that was our little <laughs> our little jab at uh, all that conservative backlash that the EC Comics used to get back in those days. They said it was destroying the minds of our children. Um, yep. And I read it, and I think I came out relatively normal. I think you've done very good, all things considered. These, if those things ruined your mind, you, they did very well for you in the end. You know, those things are going to ruin your mind. I guess at the end, of this poor, poor kid gets his breath. Yeah. Well, you know, gets your imagination going at an early age, and you learn how to use it. I have to wonder: was there any point during this production, during the script? development or shooting or even after the production was over were you, did anyone say you know what we really can't kill a little kid um no I don't recall that ever being a problem because there's always been a very subversive streak in the tales from the crypt you know the books mm -hmm. and the and the TV show and Gil and Alan, you know, they're they're pretty ballsy, subversive guys. So there was never that thing. I I wanted to cap it off with the sneaker, you know. Uh, yeah, you know, we're gonna blow up this little kid, and my exclamation point on that was going to be the sneaker. The sneaker. <laughs> yeah, I, I really wanted that shot, and the sneaker had to be a uh, uh, a high top. Right, of course. <laughs> I just like the idea that even when I'm watching it, I keep thinking, "Oh, they're going to figure out a way to save the kid, or he will be a come unpossessed." And then he blows up. I'm like, "Oh, I, well, maybe not." No, he he's dead. <laughs> so yeah. that, this, the, the movie, the, this movie's not screwing around. The kid's dead. It's over. Yeah, he blowed up real good. <laughs> he did. I can't do this, all right? I'm not the right type of person for this shit. I tried to seduce you, didn't I? I tried. You're exactly the right kind of person. Give me your hand. I can't break. He's still down there. Come on. How challenging was it to edit some of these scenes? Because obviously with all the quick cuts and the... I mean, you don't want to go overboard with it, but you do want to sell a, a particular mood. How, how difficult was it to kind of figure out the, the rhythm of some of those sequences? Um, you try it out. I mean, you're, you're, you're dealing with, you know, two or three frames here and there. Um, you want them to be almost subliminal, but not entirely. Uh, so you, you play with it. Um... Steve and I spent a lot of time, you know, playing with how exactly long those individual cuts should be. You know, we tried it. Well, it could be shorter. Okay, maybe we made it too short. <laughs> you know, and you, you, you just right. keep, keep going at it until you find it.
you do a very good job in this movie of establishing what the rules are, and that's an incredibly important in a film like this where you have things they're trying to get in. Why can't they get in? Well, why can't this happen? So how, how difficult was it or challenging for you to make sure that people could follow that through the course of the movie so that they understood a scene like this and go, oh, okay, well, he's dead. Of course that would happen. So they're not sitting here questioning it. Well, it was, uh, if I remember correctly, I, I believe it was in the script. It was uh, described that the, the the blood seals start dissolving. It's just that you make sure you just uh, get those shots, mm-hmm. um, so you can see that. And um, and I wanted to have that one last look at Gerald, in which she turns and looks over her shoulder, like she knows what's going on. Right. So do we get a better introduction to what's going to happen here? Purposely kept her in the shade, in the shadows right now until mm-hmm. she steps forward, covered with blood. Which on Jada was actually pretty sexy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not a look everyone can pull off. Nah, well, she's a beautiful lady anyway, you know. And well, sure. Yeah. Covered in blood, it's something kinky sexy about it. It all ends up the same way. Look at you. You must be in exquisite pain. All covered with blood. That's right. It's not my blood. <laughs> Bitch. So for anybody that ever wondered, what did we do with the sheriff's body? They took it upstairs and put it in the bathtub. <laughs> Good enough place to put it. Got to do something with it. Yeah. <laughs> Just like that. But then she notices that the rings are still shaking. And there he is. Uh, there you go. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the relationship between cleanliness and godliness. Well, let me tell you something. That's the first thing I... What was the critical reaction to the movie when it came out? I seem to recall some people quite enjoyed it, but, you know, it wasn't... It was definitely for those who definitely enjoyed the the horror genre and certainly the Tales from the Crypt series, but it it got some good notices, as I recall. I think it did. Um, You know, I think good notices by critics that appreciate horror films. I mean, you know, let's face it, some you know, horror films aren't aren't widely appreciated in critical circles no. too many times. It's almost considered a lesser a lesser cinematic form. But um horror has always been a great way of 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 putting out ideas, of uh selling ideas, of uh pushing ideas, of talking about some of the things that affect us as people. Um, You know, some of the best horror, like the best science fiction, talks about what's it like to be human. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of the best horror gets very political. Um, But it's not always acknowledged. Um... I think we did do pretty good. Now, this was a rewritten ending. Okay. Because cause the original ending, um, the uh, the collector shows his true self, which was a demon made of fire. And we, and we, we had a lot of R&D on this, a lot of tries at how to create a, a living fire being, which 
is easy to do now with uh, CGI. Sure. But doing it back in the days of analog effects uh, was extremely difficult. Oh, yeah. And the movie was working very well for the audience, but executives, but one executive actually wanted to know why the devil didn't try to have sex with Jada. <laughs> and we were thrown by that because we had always basically seen him as asexual, right. using, using sex, but, but being asexual himself. And uh, so we did a rewrite on this. They did a rewrite on this. Uh, some of it worked, some of it didn't. And then uh, Billy and I worked together to really craft it down into this, what we have here. So um, this was definitely a reshoot. I love that little moment where the, the fire comes out of his crotch. Mm -hmm. He's just like, yeah. oh, down boy. <laughs> yeah, that was as phallic as we were going to get on this. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was enough. It certainly, yeah. I mean, that wasn't, you know. Yeah. That worked. If I can't have your soul, I'm going to take your heart. Oh. She had the blood the whole time. Yeah. She kept it in her mouth. And he plays this beautifully, and I love what Jada does. Just watching this for the first time. The destruction of a demon like this, and kind of it hitting her. This is this is the way her oh life. My God, yeah. This is the way her life is going to be. Well, she wanted to travel. Yeah. So she's going to get to travel. Combination of a full scale explosion effect here and miniature effect on the wide shot. And what what protected her was the blood. Yep. Because it's now passed on to her. But the cat didn't make it. <laughs> it just hit oh, me. You can't, Where, where's yeah, the cat? They, well, the cat could have gotten. She couldn't pay attention to the cat all the time. She had other, I mean, at some point, you just got to focus on the fact that, you know, there's a demon in front of you who wants to steal your soul and eat you. This was actually, this here was actually the very first scene we shot. First day of shooting oh, okay. right here. So, it's always interesting shooting the end first because you have to anticipate everything that's going to happen before. And same place we did the chase, Saugus. If I remember correctly, this was uh, this was uh, we shot this in late in the afternoon and dusk, and then at night we shot some of the car chase. Now, there's an actor coming up here playing the next collector. I wanted to ask you about because I I don't think he appeared in a whole lot of other things, but he has a really memorable appearance there at the very end. Had, where did he come from? Mark Kennerly, I think was Mark Kennerly, yeah, a good friend of mine from Brooklyn. Oh, okay. He, yeah, he uh, he was uh, he worked on some of the films that I shot with Spike, and he was actually my neighbor in Brooklyn. Oh, he was okay. Out, he was out in L.A. at the time we were putting this together, and I and uh, we had to find somebody to to pay the neck to play the next uh, collector, and I told Mark to come in, and he did a good job. He did a really good job. I was actually it was, I always remembered him. I said I would have liked to have seen what this guy is like in the next movie. You know, mm -hmm. he makes a really good. You only have a couple of seconds, and he makes a really good impression. And he'll get her. He'll he'll catch up with her eventually. Now, was there any talk at all at any point of actually doing a direct sequel to this and actually following you know her or? Another uh, another collector at some point down the road, or was there a, not really any discussion about a direct sequel to Demon Knight? No, nothing that I ever heard. Um, I mean, it, it is ripe for that, you know, Geraldine, uh twenty years later. It'd be interesting to see. I love Sonic. 
Would you ever, if they came to you with another Tales from the Crypt uh, movie, would you consider it? Uh, if the script is good, I mean, you know, it's always it's always the script that that gets your mm-hmm. interest, you know. Um, and if it's something you really feel that you can do something with and 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 contribute stuff to, this was the. I mean, I was looking for a good horror film, and and then when I got this script, it was like, yeah, okay, this is something I can really have a lot of fun with. And um, it always starts with the script. Mm-hmm. And yet, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you've con- you've continued to uh, revisit the horror genre several times. I've, you did some work on The Walking Dead. You did uh, Bones in mm-hmm. 2001, which has a lot of the same kind of flavor this movie has in, in many ways. And there's is, uh, Gil is... on the left, Gil and Alan. <laughs> oh, okay, there you go. Yeah, Alan there they Cass, are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, do you see horror, horror being something you'll continue to be be a part of your career going forward? Yes, actually, uh, uh, some of the projects that I'm trying to get made are horror and science fiction. Always looking for good genre material. Always reading, trying to find something that maybe can be adapted. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I I grew up watching and reading good uh, genre material. And, um, yeah, I mean, one of the reasons I loved working on Walking Dead is because uh, uh, a lot of times the script's tapped into the poetry that, that, that can only come from a horror situation. So, uh, yeah, I hope I can do more horror. Um, Always looking for for a good, interesting, different type of type of script or type mm-hmm. of story. And so, looking back now, twenty years later, since the, the Demon Knight and the movies, I think arguably more popular now than ever. Uh, what what are your final thoughts on the experience, and uh, what you know? What was the importance of it for you in your in your career? Now now that you can look back at it with some uh, perspective, maybe. Um, it's a movie that I'm, that I'm quite proud of. Uh, I've been looking at it recently. I, I got a, a Blu-ray from Germany and, um, and I thought it played really, really well. You know, sometimes you need to have some distance right. from, from a show to really, uh, appreciate it. When it first came out, I was so close to it. And I was seeing all the all the things that I wasn't able to get made. I was looking at right. the uh, at the rewrites and and just stuff that bothered me. But now I've 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 got some distance from it, and I can I think I can appreciate it for what it is. And I think it's a pretty good movie. And I think everybody gave their best. Everybody involved mm-hmm. in it, um, and uh, everybody came to work every morning, knowing what we had to do and trying to find ways of. Uh, uh, the best ways of getting stuff done. So um, it's a it's a movie I'm really proud of. And like you said earlier, it it still holds up. Yep. Well, Ernest, thank you so much for joining us today. I think fans are really going to enjoy hearing your memories of this film, and uh, I, I can't thank you enough for uh, spending some time with us uh, looking back on Demon Knight. Thank you for having me. It was great to relive this with you. Thanks, everybody, and see you on the next track. Bye-bye, everybody.